when you were young and growing up. I bet there was that one creepy old place in your neighborhood that scared the living death out of all the local children. Some old abandoned house or other such place. The kind of place about which rumors abound and where no young person dare set foot. You're thinking about that place right now, aren't you? <laughs> Well, such a place is the subject of tonight's campfire tale. So gather round the fire, everyone. I've got a story to tell you, and it starts now. We all have that one story, don't we? The one you grow up thinking about, but never actually have the balls to tell anyone. Well, this is my story. I don't know what I'm hoping to accomplish by telling you. Maybe I'm looking for someone to tell me that I'm not insane. Or maybe once I say it out loud, it will... <laughs> I don't know. Just someone listen to this just please now let me give you a little background 20 years ago when I was 8 years old and still living with my mum my friend Dave and I decided that we would brave the house now the house was an abandoned two story home that had been empty going on 10 years save for the occasional drug abuser that would sleep there. However, that's not what made this particular house special. The standing rumor is what made it really interesting. For as long as I can remember, adults in my neighborhood had told us, the children, that it was haunted. I'm sure it was just their way of getting us not to play in it, though. Nevertheless, because of that, the house had a sort of ominous aura that hung around it. Just looking at that decaying building would give you the shivers. Although, despite our inherent fear of the place, Dave and I decided we would explore this house we would become <laughs> legends in our own right. At least, that's what we hoped. It was a Tuesday all those years ago, and well past midnight, and both of our parents had fallen asleep. The two of us decided we would sneak out, <laughs> you know, use the night as our cover. We agreed it would be best to meet up in front of the house. Still, I wish we hadn't agreed to do it. There I was, alone, waiting in front of the house for my friend. I couldn't help but feel small when I looked at it. It might have been old, and the wood may have been rotting, but man, did it look enormous. I bet even adults felt dwarfed by it. To keep myself from chickening out, I decided to think about something else while I waited. It was a little cold that night, which was the typical weather after hard rain. Ah, oh, crap, I muttered, noticing the mud that covered my shoes. I should have paid more attention to where I was stepping. Mom is going to kill me when she... My voice trailed off when I heard a dull thud from behind me. It sounded like someone knocked a door. Was, was it the house? Or was I just imagining things? I spun around expecting to see a hairy monster behind me. Instead, it was just the house. 
broken windows, splintered wood, and a roof that had more than a few holes in it. Just the usual, nothing to panic about. I should have been relieved, but I found myself slightly shaken. Soon I would be stepping into one of the most feared places in our neighborhood. I wasn't even inside yet, and I could already feel the slight tremor in my hand. Before I could reconsider the mission, Dave arrived. I quickly stuffed my hands into my pockets to hide the quiver. <laughs> I could see a small figure bouncing up and down. And the little jokester was skipping across the street. My fears were immediately replaced with giddy laughter. <laughs> you are such a clown, I managed to say in between my giggles. We both reached out and shook hands, like his father had taught us. Luckily, he didn't notice the tremor. Dave used his hands to smooth back his black hair kind of like a greaser would in a cliched movie. You ready for this? He nodded towards the door. Typical Dave. He always tried to look cool. Whether it was riding his bike with no hands or sneaking into an abandoned house, he never failed to give off the I'm a badass vibe. I tried my best to sound nonchalant. Only if you are, Davey. The comment awarded me a slight snicker. Dave hated it when I called him Davy. He said it sounded girly. <laughs> and that's exactly why I used it. Rather than shoot a retort at me, he simply nudged me towards the house. And we began walking to the door. Our small feet made quiet echoes in the streets. I was worried it might wake someone. If we had any doubts about what we were doing, that moment would have been the right time to bail out. Of course, as per the norm, stupidity got the better of us. The second our feet hit the old steps, we knew there would be no turning back. <laughs> Think we should knock? Dave joked. Seeing him act all cool somehow gave me courage, and so I knocked. What I heard made the hair on my neck stand to attention. The same thud I'd heard from earlier reverberated through the door when my knuckles landed. I gulped loudly but maintained an overall calm composure. The two of us breathed in deeply, turned the doorknob, and pushed the door open. We received a long, drawn-out creak as payment. I thought I was going to pee my pants, and Davy looked like he was about to shit a brick. <laughs> Somehow we managed to keep our undies clean. It was dark. I mean, real dark. Neither one of us had brought a flashlight. We didn't want to accidentally wake up a neighbor by shining a light into their house. Given the circumstances, we decided it was best to use moonlight. Our eyes were met with a dimly lit house. It took a minute to adjust to. The house was littered with trash, covered in graffiti, and was seemingly falling apart all over. And yet, it didn't seem as frightening as we were led to believe. Sure, the darkness made it look spooky, but as I looked at the cracked marble floor, I couldn't help but be reminded of my house. Huh, <laughs> this isn't so bad. Yes, it was me who broke the silence. Do you think the ghost will be pissed that we tracked the mud in the house? <laughs> Dave laughed and pointed at the floor. 
Little footprints followed us all over the house. <laughs> Remind me to clean my shoes before I go back home. I giggled at the thought. Here we are in the big spooky house, cracking jokes about muddy shoes. <sighs> it was all fun and games. After familiarizing ourselves with the first floor, which consisted of an empty living room, a kitchen with rotted food in the cupboards, a bathroom with a disgusting toilet, and a curious looking locked door, we decided to explore the second floor. We ascended the stairs together, Dave leading with his brave face on. The wooden stairs were old, much like the rest of the house, and each step left us wondering if it would collapse beneath us. Think the ghost is up there? I asked, half sincere. Dave chuckled at the question. <laughs> Ghosts probably aren't even real. We'd reached the end of the stairs and were on the top floor. It wasn't a big second story. Two hallways, one to the right and one to the left. Four rooms for the two of us to explore. Let's go left, Dave suggested. So we went left and into the first door. The door was already open, so we just peeked our heads in. The first thing I noticed was the hole in the roof. Moonlight was shining through it, and it gave us a faint light to survey the room with. It wasn't a very nice room. Actually, it was kind of like my room. Probably big enough to have a bed and dresser. Maybe a desk could fit in too. We couldn't see inside the closet though. The light didn't quite reach it. Dave looked at me and I looked at him. I bet there's something cool in there. Let's go look, Dave suggested with a mischievous smile. Not sure what we were hoping for exactly. A treasure in a closet or something. Just before I stepped into the room, I heard the familiar thud noise. The one that was made before, and when, I knocked on the door. My heart felt like it was going to stop. The noise was distant, but there was no mistaking it. My first instinct was to run, but I couldn't leave Dave behind. <laughs> He, of course, paid no mind to it. Hell, he was already in the room walking towards the closet. And it was at that moment that things went to hell. I never even had the chance to warn him. The second Dave stepped into the center of the room, there was a frightening crack. He didn't have time to react. The wood splintered, the ground beneath him gave way, and he fell through the floor. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Everything in front of me was crashing down. The wood was so old and decayed that it couldn't even support Davy. Dust and dirt flew everywhere. By the time it was over, it was hard to breathe. Wait, Dave didn't make a sound. Did he die on impact? Was he okay? My mind had never raced so fast. Dave! <coughs> Dave! I shouted in between coughs. Dave! Are you okay? I repeated the question a few more times and waited. After an agonizing minute, I got my response. I'm okay, he answered weakly. Not a scratch on me. I peered down the large hole that was now in front of me. Dust was everywhere, but as it cleared I could see him more clearly. 
There was Dave. <laughs> and he was completely intact. <laughs> and guess where I am? I sighed deeply, glad that he hadn't lost his sense of adventure. I'm in the locked room. Get down here. I'll open the door for you. He wiped the dirt off his forehead and motioned for me to come down. I obediently turned around and headed for the stairs, preferring to take the safe route down. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I noticed something odd. Were those big footprints always there? Two frighteningly large footprints had been left on the floor. And there was something odd about them, though. They didn't look human. Too big. Four toes. And they were round. My imagination quickly got the better of me, and I could feel the panic rising quickly. I was starting to feel nauseous, even more so when I realized the footsteps were leading to the room that Dave was in. I glanced at the front door. It was open. I could leave right now. Run home and tell my parents to call the police. <laughs> we didn't have cell phones back then. But I didn't do any of that. I just kept walking towards the locked room. The door was open. And I could see shadows dancing on the door frame. There were two shadows, one big and one small. The larger shadow was pounding into the smaller one. I could hear the blows landing. Thump, 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 thump. Each time it hit, Dave would whimper. I was frozen in place. The door was only a few feet away, but I couldn't bring myself to take another step. I wanted to save my friend, but I just couldn't move. I could only stand there and watch the shadows. Please, stop! Smash! The last hit was harder than any of the other ones. I could hear the bones break from where I was standing. Dave's shadow stopped moving. The larger shadow picked up the frail little body and began slashing into it with what looked like a blade. A dark liquid splashed onto the door and started oozing towards the floor. I wanted to puke. I could feel hot liquid running down my pants. I must have been scared enough to piss myself. I looked at the floor and saw the puddle that I'd made. Oh, it was time to leave. I took one last glance at the door, and what I saw when I looked up still haunts me today. A large humanoid figure stood in the doorway, holding Dave's body. It was too dark to see it clearly, but I got a peek at its eyes. Its big, blue eyes. Big and blue like the ocean, and the waves were rippling with rage. I wanted to leave. No, I needed to leave, but my legs refused to move. They were anchored to the floor. Fear had stopped them completely. My heart, on the other hand, was moving. It was moving very fast. Reluctantly, I stood there, staring at the monster that was holding my dead friend. It didn't take long for our eyes to meet. We stood there in an eternal staring contest. I was too afraid to blink. I remember thinking that if I closed my eyes, I would never open them again. It was only after two 
long minutes that I could finally feel my legs again. So I slowly took a step back. The monster mimicked my movements by stepping forward each time I took a step back. My heart sunk when I realized what it was doing. Every molecule in my body was telling me to turn around and sprint. But could I really outrun this monstrosity? No. There was no way. I decided to keep my pace. Buy myself time until I got to the door. Once we reached the living room, it dropped Dave outstretched its arms towards me and grinned. It was the single most wicked thing I'd experienced in my life. The monster's grin from corner to corner reached both of its eyes. His teeth were long and white like a shark. We were almost at the door. But he was no longer mimicking my steps. For each step I took, he took two. Step by step, he was closing the gap. The moonlight from the window shined on his outstretched arm. Its hand was human-like, only there was something off about it. The nails were long, the skin was rotted and some of the flesh looked like it had been scratched off. It was enough to make me dizzy. Soon, I could hear it breathing. Each breath was labored. It was almost wheezing. One more step and I would see its entire body in the moonlight. I didn't want that. That thought alone was enough to make me turn, grab the doorknob, throw it open and rush out of the house. I didn't dare look over my shoulder until there was some distance between the two of us. I expected to turn around and see the monster lumbering after me, but surprisingly it wasn't. The monster never came out of the house. It didn't chase me down the street. It didn't rip me to pieces. It just stood there, on the porch, waving goodbye. His malformed hand slowly rocking back and forth, with the same deranged smile on its face. A few days later, when the police report was made public, my parents told me that the monster was just a hobo on drugs. The police had found Dave's body next to a dead homeless man. Apparently he'd overdosed shortly after I'd left. I tried to tell myself that I was just imagining things and that there was no monster. But I don't know what to believe. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I can't get that fucking smile out of my head. I'm done with this. If I say any more, I'll start having nightmares again. Ah, food's here anyway. I just heard a knock at the door. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>
Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm very pleased to introduce the very first story I'm narrating from Dr. Creepin's Vault. The subreddit I set up for aspiring authors to send stories for me to narrate on this very channel. So, gather round the campfire. I've got a little story to tell you. And it begins right here, right now. Preface. This story is primarily fiction, but the town and farm are real. The main event that led up to the events is a true childhood horror, and it will never leave my mind. I know there are thousands of people who don't believe in God or the devil. I wish I was telling you a God-fearing story of how an angelic being appeared and changed my whole fucked up life. But this is not one of those stories. I'm not sure if God is real. And if he is, I don't know how he allowed such an evil to walk his green earth. I do believe in the devil. I have met his gaze, and I don't think I can ever shake all the hopelessness I saw in those cold black eyes. They were endless pools of black. It seemed as if the light didn't even reflect off of them. They were empty, and now that empty feeling is eating at me from the inside. And I don't know how much longer I can deny him. I can hear his breathy voice on the breeze, and it's calling my name. I used to love small, quaint little towns. Have you ever been to a small town? Well, in case you haven't, I'll elaborate a bit. I don't mean towns of like 16,000 people. I am talking about the towns that have a population of under 1,000. The kind of towns you would miss if you drove by them and blinked. They are the kind of places that live in children's books and country songs. Towns where everyone knows everyone, and most of the population is stretched out over miles of rural gravel roads. <laughs> Can you picture it yet? Towns where you have to have a truck because the creek floods when it rains more than an inch. In the wintertime, these roads remain blankets of white as there are not any plows to come to the rescue. <laughs> Unless the neighboring farmer has a tractor and is feeling generous. I grew up on an 80-acre farm in a small, quaint town called Silver. This town is not much of a town. I can only imagine that it is considered a town at all because of the local post office and the handful of police officers. I have fond memories of the farm, regardless of the events that have recently occurred. I still can't say I have a hate for that place. My grandparents purchased that land and worked hard to get everything they had. They were God-fearing people. but. They didn't necessarily go to church every Sunday. I do recall my grandmother having Joyce Myers on TV when I'd get up most Sunday mornings. My grandparents helped my father raise me, as my mother was uh, in and out of the picture. They were like my second parents. They made me who I am today, and I miss them dearly. I truly think they are what helped keep the darkness away. Before I can get into the present, I need to talk a little more about my past. My parents had their problems, and I could write a whole book about the things that should have 
and would have been. I do believe that negative actions can let negative things into your daily life. Hmm, and this rule helps spark these events. My parents abused drugs, mostly pills, for most of my early childhood. They would get messed up at home, and if these things got too crazy, my grandmother would come and pick me up, which was easy because she lived within a five-minute walk from our trailer. My mother was very drawn to the paranormal, and this has some bearing on why I share this same fascination. She would read tarot cards and dabble in witchcraft. Now, I'm not saying my mother was a full-blown Salem witch, but she has told me she'd participate in spells and seances with her friends. She also <laughs> didn't have a full bearing on what she was messing with. This, along with unknown things, led to the event I'm going to try to describe to you. I had to be around four years old when this happened. My parents were suckers and they would let me sleep in their bed, even though I had my own bed. I remember waking up to my mother screaming. I can't remember anything she was saying, but I remember the tone in voice wasn't anything I'd heard come from her mouth before. She had me wrapped up in the big duvet, and I remember the room being so cold that my nose hurt. She had me wrapped up so tightly, my legs and arms had fallen asleep. She was in the right-hand corner of the room, sitting on the floor, and had me on her lap. The bathroom light was on, and flooded a portion of the room with light. The light shone primarily on the bed. My eyes followed the light, and what I saw still haunts me today. My father was levitating about a foot off the bed. He wasn't calmly levitating either. He looked like he was being pulled. He was tightly gripping the posts of the headboard, mumbling something I couldn't understand. My mother sat me down on the floor and told me not to move and to close my eyes. Of course, I didn't close my eyes. I was so scared, but I couldn't look away. My mum entered the room with a Bible and began reading a scripture and praying. My father began to convulse and flail about all while still a foot off the bed and hanging onto the headboard. As quickly as it started, it stopped. My father fell to the bed after his body lurched forward. I don't remember exactly what happened after this, but I quit sleeping in my parents' room after that. As an adult, my mother has told me that she saw it leave she'd called my grandmother when she went to get the bible she said it was a very dark shadow it shot off my father's feet and slithered out of the cracked window in the bedroom the moment my grandmother walked into the house now this ties into the story later the paranormal has always been a part of my life. The supernatural doesn't scare me anymore. It will surprise me from time to time, but I won't allow it to scare me. However, the thing that I've recently encountered does scare me. I can feel it in my bones, and it's like nothing that I've ever felt before. After my grandparents passed away, my father and I inherited the 80-acre farm, along with everything else they owned. I came down from the city to help my father go over paperwork and get all the affairs in order the day I got the news that my grandmother was gone. It was a happy and sad evening. 
We stayed in the house that night. We laughed and cried and told stories about the good old days. The house didn't feel eerie at all. In fact, the feeling of the house didn't change until my grandmother was laid to rest. I really think her spirit stayed with us over that week and left after she saw we were going to be okay and her remains were next to my grandfather. After the funeral, the family all came back to the farm and we ate and reminisced. With each person that left, the house got colder. I don't mean cold as in temperature. It's as if the atmosphere just began to change. My father was the last person to leave. He helped me clean up and, as he was leaving, offered for me to stay at his house. I had a bad feeling about staying at the farm, but I declined and said I would be fine. He stood there and looked like he wanted to say something to persuade me to leave with him, but he didn't. I walked him out to the truck and waved goodbye to him. I stood in the opening of the garage door and lit a cigarette. I hadn't smoked for weeks, but this week had earned me a few smokes. <laughs> the floodlights were drawing what seemed like a million bucks to the area I was standing in. I swatted a swarm of them out of my face and went to the garage and flipped off the light. It was so dark. If you've never been in a rural area at night, you're missing out. You can see stars you didn't even know existed. I felt like I could see entire galaxies out there. But when I turned the light off this time, I didn't feel adventurous. I felt scared. I questioned myself. <laughs> Why are you scared? You grew up here. You've been in this yard when it's dark too many times to count. But there was an uneasy feeling in the air. I flipped my cigarette out onto the gravel driveway, and right as I hit the button to close the garage door, I heard something scrambling around on the tin roof of the garage. I hurriedly opened the door that led into the living room and locked the door behind me. As the garage door was closing, I saw a glimpse of what looked like something's legs. I closed all the blinds and triple checked that every door and window was locked. I went to the interior pantry and grabbed one of grandmother's shotguns and grabbed a handful of shells from the shelf. I loaded the gun, sat down on the couch, and listened. I was holding my breath to see if I could hear anything. I didn't hear anything at first. Then I heard a thump on the roof, and then footsteps. I felt my eyes welling up with tears of fear and anger. Then I heard a scratching sound and it sounded like sporadic claws being drug along the siding and roof of the house. I even heard a sharp squeal of what sounded like something metal and sharp being run across the windows of the living room. I felt a tear slide down my face. I wanted to call my father, but I didn't want him to be in danger. I didn't know who or what was out there. The cops wouldn't be able to get here for a while, and then they would probably tell me I'd been in the city too long and it was just the sounds of the country. I don't really know what happened at this point, but I woke up on the couch around 6.30 a.m. The sun was shining through a crack in the blinds, but the house still felt heavy. 
I unloaded the shotgun and put it back in the pantry. I grabbed my keys and my purse and hesitated a little when I went to hit the garage door opener. The door mechanically squealed open and I cautiously walked outside. I fumbled for my pack of cigarettes and lit one and walked out into the sunlight. I walked to the side of the garage to get into my car when I noticed a strange set of prints on the ground. I still really don't know how to describe them. They kind of looked like hooves, but that would be impossible. I then decided it had to be a large cat, and the dry ground had distorted the tracks, <laughs> and that had to be what was messing with me the prior evening. I went to my father's house and didn't mention anything that had happened. We still had a few things to take care of around the farm. The fields needed to be mowed, and most of the items in the house were going to need to be packed up. So, he rode back to the farm with me. When we got back to the house, I saw something lying in the driveway. I stopped a few feet away from what it was, and my father got out first. It was a lamb. A mutilated lamb. My father looked it over and then went to the garage and grabbed a large trash bag. Looks like a stray dog chased this guy from someone else's property, he said while shaking his head. I knew no one kept sheep near us, and our land didn't border anyone else's land. But I know my father was just trying to justify the clearly odd situation. We worked around the house and were about halfway through the packing and cleaning. We both flopped down at the kitchen table and started to chat. I glanced out of the window and didn't realize how dark it had gotten. I mentioned that we should head back to his house. He looked at me puzzled and asked why I wasn't staying at the farm. I stumbled over my words and then he said, it's a little spooky out here by yourself, huh? <laughs> he chuckled. We started to my car and loaded a few small boxes that had belongings my father was taking to his house. There was rustling in the overgrown hay in the fields, and it was close. I told my dad to get in the car. He shrugged and opened the passenger door. I looked out into the dark field and saw a figure standing in the tall hay. Now, I'm five foot five and the hay was a little over my waist. The hay hit the figure in the field at about the knees. Even though it was dark, I could tell their head was off to one side. It was like they were <laughs> tilting their head like a dog does when they hear a high-pitched sound. The figure was very thin and had something on its head. I just couldn't figure out what it was. My father started to get out of the car, but I locked the doors and slammed my foot on the accelerator. Gravel hit the still open garage and a cloud of dust trailed behind the car. My father was yelling at me, asking me what I was doing. I looked out my car window and saw that the hay was swaying behind the car in the field next to me. The thing was chasing us. I could see that in the moonlight that it had horns, but not like our local deer. I couldn't place them. I turned my eyes away and my father was staring out of the passenger window. He tapped me on the shoulder, and I turned my gaze to the right. Out in the woods that met the fields, there were sets of eyes. I don't mean two or three. I would say sixty or more. I can't be sure, but it looked like hundreds. 
My father didn't speak until we were in the house, with the door locked. After speaking about what it could be, we decided it had to be a deer that was running by us. The eyes must have just been a trick of the moonlight. The next day, my father and I reluctantly headed back to the farm. The tension in the air was almost tangible. After working on packing, my father and I sat out on the back porch and looked across the golden fields. Let's take a walk, he said. I unwillingly dragged myself from my seats on the porch. I told him to hold on and ran inside to grab my boots. We started to head back to the entrance of the fields that all of the outbuildings were on. As we were walking through the fields again, talking about my grandparents, we caught a waft of something rancid. Now, as you've gathered, I grew up on a farm and have come across dead animals in the field before. My grandfather was an avid hunter and fisherman, so I'd smelled some pretty terrible smells. But this wasn't like anything I'd ever experienced. It smelled like rot, blood, trash and sewer. I started to gag and my father put his hand over his mouth, but soon followed my reaction. We walked towards the smell. We were standing on an open, relatively flat, piece of land. My boots hit something metal under where we were standing and made a hollow ping sound. My father looked down and then looked at me with a perplexed look on his face. We kicked away the cut hay that had been laid over the area. It revealed a large square metal plate. Have you seen this before? I questioned. My father didn't say anything. He just shook his head. We stupidly decided to move the metal plate because that's a good idea, right? <laughs> when we did, there was an incredibly deep, round hole almost like a well. It was dark even in the bright afternoon sun. The horrid smell was the first thing that hit us. It was like a forceful wind of putrid air. My father and I just peered down the hole. Then we heard a chuckle. It echoed from the hole. I started to back up when I saw something in the darkness. Then we heard a scrambling around, like something was coming out of the hole. We started to run, but we stopped, entranced by what was happening. All I can remember are the eyes, all black and sunken into a thin face. I see those eyes every time I close my eyes. I was now on my hands and knees and was leaning into the hole with my eyes glazed over, according to my father. My father bellowed, move, and his voice snapped me out of my trance and I hurriedly crawled away from the hole. My father somehow lifted that metal plate and slammed it down on the hole, and we heard a screech unlike anything we'd ever encountered. It was like a barn owl and a panther, but it was so haunting and loud. I put my hands over my ears and my father grabbed my arm and basically dragged me to my car and threw me into the passenger seat. We drove in silence, other than the sound of my labored breathing. 
When we got to his house, he put my bags in the car and told me I needed to go back to the city as soon as possible. He continued to tell me that he didn't know how that hole got there, or what the fuck was going to come out of it, but that he had seen those eyes before. He told me the night he levitated, he saw a shadow at the end of the bed, and it had a hold of his legs, and it had those same eyes. I returned to the city that very evening after I'd calmed down. It's been a few months since this all happened. I think this thing that had possessed my father is coming after me. My grandparents are gone and there is no one here to protect me. I was looking in the mirror the other day and I swear I saw my eyes change for a second. I saw those cold, dead eyes staring back at me. I don't know what is going to happen to me, but I know that if you see an 80-acre farm for sale in silver, don't buy it. Please, don't. No matter how much it appeals to you. If you do, you might find yourself looking into those dead, black, eyes. And I might be the one looking back at you. captain and his crew chance upon what appears to be an abandoned vessel deep in the ocean. Upon boarding the ship they discover a young deckhand all alone and in a state of some distress. What happened to the crew? Join me around the campfire ladies and gentlemen as I tell you his story. As you might have already guessed, the origin of the term ghost ship has very little to do with ghosts. It was used to refer to ships found at sea without crews. In the early ages of maritime travel, it wasn't unheard of to find a derelict whose crew was washed out to sea by a savage storm or ravaged by the plague. In the mind of the superstitious mariner, this suggested all sorts of outrageous stories. Tales of seafaring monsters and sirens luring unfortunate sailors to their doom were all too prevalent, overshadowing the more likely causes of piracy and sickness. I don't doubt the spreading of such ridiculous tales was due in part to those who wished to scare others off the lucrative field of maritime salvage. Even a small ship could net a lucky crew a tidy sum, not including the boat's cargo. Knowing this, how could these silly stories of haunted boats and their spectral crew sound like nothing more than a clumsy attempt 
to keep you from a fair reward. I could never believe in those sorts of stories. I knew that their kind was meant for children, and not a rational person, like a true sailor should be. But they did interest me. It was fascinating to hear what wicked tales some fanciful mind had cooked up, and decide just what could have really happened. I never liked the retelling of such folk tales, for the spread of these stories only served to make crews more skittish. I loved to dissect them, and understand what makes us such a superstitious lot. I thought I understood the mind of my fellow sailor, all the intricate little beliefs and fears that <laughs> made us human. All it took was one simple story to make me realize my own arrogance. I'm going to break one of my own rules by telling it to you, but try to understand. This is more for your benefit than mine. Take from it what you will, but don't think for a moment that I am just trying to frighten you with silly ghost stories. It doesn't matter whether or not the tale is real, just that you understand the underlying message. There was once a young man who'd grown up in poverty and wanted nothing more than to escape his hard life on land for a more adventurous one at sea. At the age of sixteen, he ran away and joined the crew of a tramp steamer out of New York. Of course, he had to lie about his age, but the captain understood his situation. It was a harsh adjustment for the boy, but he managed admirably. The shifting waves of the open ocean are far less hospitable to a man's stomach than the solid ground of land. As the newest crew member, he had a great many things to prove, and the best way to prove them was to take any and every job asked of him. Unfortunately, these jobs were <laughs> always the least desirable ones. Often tedious and sometimes dangerous, the boy willingly accepted any challenge offered him. I don't mean to say he didn't enjoy his work. Being worked to the bone afforded him little time to himself, and night watch on the deck gave him ample time for that. He'd often find himself lost in thought as he paced about the deck, staring out over the inking black waters. There was never anything to see upon the lapping waves but darkness, and it made him feel as if nothing existed beyond what he could see in the ship's running lights. It was on one such night that the boy found it. He actually heard it before he saw it. The sound mingled with the crash of waves against the hull, giving it a strangely musical tone. It was like the stretching of metal upon metal, but conducted by an orchestra, a strange and lonely, yearning call. Or so thought the fanciful mind of a boy, not yet a man. In the direction of the sound, he could see the faint lights in the distance. Though it hadn't been foggy that night, the water particles in the air made the light look gaseous and unnatural. As you can imagine, the boy's fancy was excited by the sight. Though he didn't believe in ghosts or monsters at sea, he was by no means curious. As his ship neared the light, the boy saw that he wasn't looking at his first spirit, but the running lights of a boat slightly larger than his own. Rocking perilously at the mercy of the waves, he couldn't see a single soul on deck. Its surface was covered in rust, and the detritus left from waves above the deck line. As it bobbed up and down upon the unforgiving sea, the boy realized the creaking hull of the derelict 
was causing the strange musical notes. From just a single sight of the thing, he knew something was very wrong. His call for alarm had drawn the attention of not only the crew still awake, but half of those sleeping. Within a minute's time, over twenty men, including the captain and first mate, stood staring at the lifeless ship, bobbing upon the waves. Amidst the flurry of excited discussion, the boy caught words like survivors and salvage. But he could not tear his eyes away from the thing. It moved almost hypnotically on the ocean, and the creaking musical notes began to develop a hauntingly ominous quality. He thought it was almost pleading. When the boy mentioned it to the other men, no one paid it any attention. It didn't take long to pull the ship up beside the derelict and lash the two together with rope and whatever boarding hooks they could find. The abandoned ship seemed undamaged for the most part, and had no trouble floating. Being the one who'd first spotted the vessel, the boy's captain eagerly volunteered him for the first party to board it. He was understandably nervous about setting foot on the ship, but his duty was clear. Ten men, armed with flashlights, flooded the empty deck in search of survivors. The boy stuck to the protective side of his captain, though outwardly he tried to put on a tough face. As much as he hoped to find anyone alive, the searching party found no one. Oh, they found plenty of signs of life, but not one living soul. Clothes left thrown on bunks as if they'd been changed and tossed aside in a hurry. Food left half-eaten in the galley to collect mould. He'd even spotted a few mouse traps and droppings, but not one furry little stowaway could be located. The bosun suspected the crew had abandoned ship due to fear of disease or piracy, but they found no lifeboats missing. Other theories floated about the crew as they searched, but the boy noticed no one seemed worried about the state of the ship, or of the mounting intensity of the musical creaking. After finding nothing in the crew quarters and officially deciding that their expedition was no longer a rescue, but a salvage, they moved greedily to the hole. Though it was damp, the cargo seemed mostly intact. The boy didn't know what most of it was, but the captain seemed quite excited by their find. The rest of the searchers seemed pleased, and completely oblivious to the booming, metallic scraping that echoed in his ear since he'd stepped onto the damned ship. It had never been this loud. There was no doubt in his mind that the musical creaking came from here, the belly of the ship. The boy had to slap his hands to his ears to shut it out. Why can't you hear it? He bellowed as he sunk to the floor. Don't you see it's not safe here? But no one listened to him. They were all old veterans of the sea. They did not fear the old tales, nor did they fear the rantings of a child pretending to be a man. He yelled and grew violent in his attempt to make the sailors leave. When they tried to lay hands on him, the boy threw savage punches at his assailants. It took five men to wrestle him to the ground and drag him back to their ship. Once there, the boy was thrown into a cell. The captain left him with a sad look on his face, placing the keys to his prison quite visible on a table in plain view. 
There he stayed for the next two days, in a blinding agony with that musical screeching deafening him. On the dawn of the third day, the boy awoke to find the sound faded from what he assumed was distance. Had the crew listened to him and abandoned the derelict after all? As the day dragged on, the musical calling continued to fade until he was left with the silence of his own ship. Silence. No hum of motors or clomping footsteps. No voices. No one had come to give him his meals. His stomach twisted painfully as the implications ran through his mind. He had to get out. The flimsy frame of his cell's bed came apart easily, offering up a straight metal pole, long enough to hook the table legs. Within minutes he'd pulled it close enough to grab his cell's keys off its surface and throw open his cage. However, the joy of freedom was overshadowed by his growing sense of dread. There was nothing but the echoing sound of groaning metal to greet him. The boy found his ship in a state much like he'd expected. No signs of a struggle, but not a single sailor on board but himself. Just like the derelict, food had been left partially consumed, and clothing left on floors and bunks as if forgotten. What little he knew of the operation of the ship, he could tell the engines and boiler had been left to idle and eventually die from lack of attention. It was as if his entire crew had dropped everything they were doing and left without a word. Forty-seven men had disappeared and left no trace. The worst of all was that the derelict he'd been so irrationally frightened of had gone. In the yellowing evening light, he could see for miles in all directions, but there was nothing he could see, just more ocean. The boy felt oppressively alone in his empty ship on a cold, uncaring sea. Where had they all gone? Did they take the derelict? But why did they leave him here alone? Was his offence enough that his captain would doom him to death at sea? The boy struggled to find a rational explanation for everything, but rationality was in short supply. Every time he tried to think, that creakingly musical, beckoning sound would play in his head and cloud his mind. As you can imagine, attempting to run a steamer that required a crew of at least twenty by yourself would be an impossible task, but he tried. It was more or less just to pass the time until his possible rescue and keep his mind from wandering to less productive thoughts. The radio did not reach far enough to effect a rescue, and he had no idea how to tell where he was anyway. All he could do was to tend to the ship and hope. But really, it wouldn't matter in the end. As the days came and went, the waves crashing against the hull began to give him nightmares. It was the music of the sea. The incessant drumming of the waves, the piping groan of the hull in protest, and the sad, lonely song of the wind. It all sounded so familiar to him, and, as he realized why, the song had begun to invade his waking world. The lonely, beckoning song of the derelict but this time heard from the beginning and coming from his ship.
It wasn't fear that made him turn off the ship's running lights and destroy its beacon. It wasn't fear that drove him to pile as much food and fresh water as he could comfortably fit into his cell, lock himself in, and throw the keys over the deck. No. It was... resignation. So now... You understand why I can't open this door. And why I couldn't tell your captain what happened to the rest of my crew. If I seem calm, it's only because I know there's no helping what will become of me. You've heard the song. I know you have. I can see it in your eyes. You've all heard her lonely call, whether you realize it or not. But I can tell you will understand. If you truly want to know what happened to my fellows, then, then by all means stay. I suspect I shall join them soon. I have no doubt you'll never hear word from the derelict or my crew again. And anyone who stays on this vessel will likely disappear as well. <laughs> Laugh if you like. Call this a silly ghost story. It doesn't matter in the end. But if you want to avoid my fate, then you and your mates need to leave this damned ship. You're probably wondering what brought this curse upon our heads. I did. Was it something in the hold of that devil derelict? Was it something in the air? Or was it really a ghost, ravenous for the souls of the living? Like I said, I don't know myself, but I have my suspicions. I'm sure you do as well. The superstitions of the past aren't lost on me now. And I wonder if the old belief that a boat without a crew cries out in pain, in loneliness. You can hear it now too, can't you? The song. It's the call of the one true siren. A ship with no crew is no ship at all. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>